Beatrice. Thank you, President. Uh, we're going to uh, question and answers now. Can you can I please ask you to identify yourselves and the, and the media you, uh, uh, you represent when asking the question? Uh, I saw the first hand go up down there, yes. the lady. Thank you, Rebecca Christie from Bloomberg. Thanks very much for coming this morning. Wanted to ask if you had 2016 projections for total financing coming out from the EIB group and also total borrowing that you guys will use to fund those activities. Thank you. As cautious people like we are, we are targeting 71 plus 7 for 2016, plus the activities of the fund. This cannot be said exactly, because the borrowing plan depends on the repayments that uh, will take place in 2016, which are not fully predictable. Uh, but uh, our, our borrowing normally is somewhere between 60 and 85 billion euros, and in that range it will remain uh, again, uh, we have started the the borrowing program for 2016 forcefully at the beginning of the year with the, for, with the first uh, big uh, tickets in U.S. dollars and in British pounds. So it is well on track. Okay. Um, let's go here. Yeah. Thank you. Sonia Van Rensen for Energy Post and Views. Uh, I had two questions. You, you mentioned climate environment are at the centre of the EIB's work. Are you actively doing anything to phase out support for fossil fuel projects? Uh, and secondly, um, are the, the EIB is considering a loan to the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, so a gas infrastructure project. Do you see that as in line with the Paris Agreement and with the EU's climate policy? Thank you. Oh, sorry. The fundamental point is the EIB lending policy in energy is resource neutral. It is emission oriented. And uh, we are strictly within the limits set there, and we are strictly in the limits of the international agreements on this. On the concrete uh, investment program you asked, uh, yeah, but can you please take that over? We can give you more detailed figures afterwards when you have direct access to the uh, uh, engineers that are busy with that project, I cannot respond in the detail. Yes, in general, I mean, questions that very precisely about individual projects would probably follow that, that uh, have that destiny. I want to go to the other side briefly. Good morning, Jorge Valero from Euractiv. Uh, two questions, if I may, please. Uh, first, uh, uh, the case of uh, Avengoa has impact how the EIB assess the, the projects uh, proposed for the investment plan. That will be my first question. And the second question is uh, if you could update us on the state of play of the talks between the EIB and the other institutions in China uh, to set up a mechanism for the part Chinese participation on the investment bank and the investment plan, and if the current turbulences emerging from China could affect this talk somehow. First question, I need to uh, remind you that uh, we signed a, a loan to Abengoa to support its research, uh, in, uh, development and innovation activities in 2015. Volume was 200, no, 125 million euros. And part of the loan is supported by a guarantee under FC. Uh, we are in contact with the uh, company concerning the company's filing for creditor protection, and we are following the procedure very attentively. At this stage, it's much too early to say what impact the latest developments will have on the EIB loan. Uh, I think uh, the information about the difficulties the company is in came at the right point in time, so we did not run into real difficulties, but we are observing this very closely. And there is one thing that I would like to remind everybody of. When we entered FC and the philosophical discussions behind FC, it was always in the context of the pressure to take more risks. Yeah, that happens. And therefore, uh, I think we uh, will continue to, to watch closely what is happening. I do not expect a major effect on the 
PNL of the bank. And the second question is China. Well, it is too difficult to, to say, to make a prediction. Otherwise, I'd personally become a rich man. What the impact of the uh, present market developments in China will be, uh, I would uh, suggest to, to cautiously wait and see, not to draw conclusions prematurely. On the other hand, uh, we are uh, in close contact with Chinese investors and the Chinese authorities because we are aware of the interest in the investment plan for Europe. And since we are organizing investment platforms all around Europe, where also non-European uh, investors might participate, this is an interesting thing for, for, for investors from China as well. We are absolutely open for that. And this is part also of the agreements between the European Union and China signed last year. Uh, in this context, we have also uh, engaged very heavily in the advice and support of the setting up of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which uh, this week will be formally established in Beijing. Uh, we had been asked by the Chinese authorities very early in the process of being available for advice because they had some ideas and some wishes to uh, to take uh, EIB a little bit as an example when it comes to certain standards and criteria that they would have to apply, for instance, when it comes to procurement for social and environmental standards and so forth. So we have sent uh, a very, very high-ranking expert advice to China as well, and we are very uh, interested in finding a new cooperation partner with uh, the AIIB, in particular when it comes to businesses uh, outside of uh, China and outside of Europe. Uh, the Silk Road idea is very uh, attractive for us as well, and uh, we are cooperating well with them. Let's go here. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Simon Marks from Market News International. Um, I wanted to ask about your investment strategy. Um, I know as part of your yearly operations, you use your paid-in capital. Uh, I think it's eight, eight, 80 billion, and you invest that in high-quality assets. And there's a kind of low yields in, in, in interest rate environment at the moment, which is, I think you've said in a recent report or last year's report that is threatening your your investment strategy to a to a degree. And I'm just um, to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but um, are, are you thinking about perhaps investing in higher, uh, ris riskier assets to, to address this? Um, and secondly, uh, another question I had, I think you've mentioned in the past that you were looking into whether or not EIB loans uh, went uh, towards uh, Volkswagen and its, and its uh, cheating on emissions tests. And I'm just wondering how that inquiry is, is going and whether what you've found out in, in, in that degree. Thank you. Thank you. Well, moving in a low interest environment is not easy, but it's not, it's not easy for all market participants on both sides, demand and supply. Look at the pension funds, the insurers and others who do not know where to put their liquidity nowadays. So it is therefore, it would therefore, for instance, be very attractive for us to reach more of these liquidity parts. Uh, which would make our life easier and the life of the insurers as well. That requires, again, an environment in which that is more easily possible. I, I call for a separate uh, asset class for infrastructure and the necessary regulatory changes in this respect for many years. And I hope things will finally move in 2016. It's urgently necessary. Um, but there is one thing that must be quite clear. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization but it's definitely not a for-loss bank. We will also make sure that we, re that we keep, maintain, strengthen the trust of the people who entrust us with their funds. 60 to 85 billion euros per year. And that means that we have to come up with first-class, economically viable and sustainable projects. This is the basis for the considerable surplus we have achieved in 2015 again, 
I do not have the exact figures yet because the books are not closed, of course, in the second week of, of January. But once we will publish that uh, first vis-a-vis -vis our shareholders and the auditors and then vis-a-vis -vis you, you will see that this has been a very profitable bank again. So from that point of view, we are clean. And we must be clean, not be in order we want to maximize our profits, but we need to strengthen the capital base of the bank because we do not go back to the member states as shareholders and ask them for contributions every year, not, not, normally not every decade. So it, it's a very long distance between the capital increase of the bank we can take care of the strengthening of the capital basis more or less ourselves, unless we have huge new challenges like the one that went along with the last capital increase during the economic crisis. And uh, therefore, we have to make sure that the strong position of the, market, uh, of the bank on the market is maintained. We completely depend upon the idea of crowding in. Second question is, is on Volkswagen. Uh, Volkswagen is, of course, a, a long-term partner of, of the bank uh, for, for many, many years. We have been active in, in high-tech research and development with Volkswagen. And uh, therefore, and I think I was pretty explicit in Lima when the thing came up at that time, uh, we were uh, astonished, disappointed, and we are now concerned about the allegations, including indications by senior company executives of improper and possibly fraudulent behavior by Volkswagen. In addition to official investigations, the EIB is undertaking its own review into this matter. Whilst our review continues, based on our findings so far, we cannot exclude that there may be a link between a part of a 400 million EIB euro loan to Volkswagen signed in 2009, that's Volkswagen Antrieb RDI, and in the investigated activities. It still needs to be established whether any part of the loan was misused in that way. The loan was repaid by Volkswagen in full, according to the schedule in 2014. Based on information available to us today, no other EIB operation, either repaid or outstanding, uh, has a link to the defeat software in any way. So in order to be on the safe side and also to preserve the interests of the bank, and that means also the interests of our shareholders, uh, we have decided to put on hold any new loans for Volkswagen for the time being. Uh, we will consider information, findings and recommendations emerging from our own review and from ongoing judicial investigations on a regular basis and reassess our position based on those findings at the latest within a year. Good morning, Peter Teffer for EU Observer. Uh, a couple of questions about the Fund for Strategic Investment. Um, could you explain to non-economists like myself how it's possible that the EIB 5.7 billion generates 25 billion in, uh, mobilizes 25 billion, while the EIF's 1.8 billion generates the same amount? Like, where does that difference come from? And secondly, as you said, the governance structure was not done yet while many of these projects were approved. Um, so that means that for about 126 projects, they still need to be um, approved by, by Mr. Moulter, if I'm if understanding this correctly, right? So um, what happens if he says these projects are no good? Um, will the EIB group then, then finance them themselves, or uh, is it there any other way? I mean, could they be cancelled? And what then happens to the mobilized funds? Perhaps Mr. Moulter can also give some comment himself about how he will independently look at all these projects that the EIB group itself has already said are, are good ideas. Thanks. Well, the, the basic idea of the Juncker plan is that the bank, with its expertise in particular when it comes to the engineering side and the financial side, makes the necessary due diligence for each and every project and then comes to the conclusion to say, yes, it's a good project. A project that we might be able to undertake without FC under special uh, activities, but that is a very limited volume that is available for that. If we want to do it in any case and with higher volumes, then we would need an EU budget guarantee because normally the trick here is the risk of the project or the rating of the counterpart is lower than we would require it for our own business. With the budget guarantee, and the small tranche that is covered by the budget guarantee, we will be able to finance that project. So we will have to gain experience now. What happens if we believe it's a good project? 
We approve the project in the board of directors of uh, in, the, in the management committee of the bank, and we give it then to the board of directors for final approval, and at the same time to the investment committee in order to decide about the availability of the budget guarantee. And this is where Mr. Motra, who is chairing this investment committee, comes into play. Now, if the if the investment committee uh, it, it's not a personal uh, hobby of Mr. Moltra, but the members of the, the elected members of the investment committee come to the conclusion that they would not be in favor of a support through a budget guarantee. Then we have to think whether we still believe it's such a good project that we put it under special activities and, and let it go on, or whether we would then, under these circumstances, uh, at least the volume of this project cannot be serviced by the bank. This is going to be the procedure. We'll have to, to gain some experience with that. Um, but uh, you can rest assured that once a project has gone through the, the due diligence of our engineers, economists and, economists and lawyers, then that means we believe it's a good, economically viable and sustainable project. But if during the process in the investment committee new arguments come up which we might have not seen, then of course we must be flexible enough to uh, arrive at uh, responsible decisions. Yeah, well, this is this is a very technical one because of the products that EIB and EIF offer, and the Secretary General is uh, wonderful in, ex in explaining this in, in technical terms. <laughs> Thank you, President. I'll try not to be too technical, and afterwards it can be picked up uh, bilaterally, as you indicated. I think there are two elements. EIB is predominantly a debt product, product, which by definition has a lower multiplier, while EIF is predominantly an equity product. EIB predominantly works with the final project promoters directly, while EIF predominantly works through intermediary. It is a fund of funds. Hence, the, at the level of the fund that EIF supports, there will be a multiplier once again. And similarly, in the guarantee activity of the EIF, it provides a guarantee, a partial guarantee, to banks who have taken, in particular, SME loans on board. So you therefore have inbuilt multipliers, as the President was, say, uh, was indicating, by the type of product and by the very nature that, in particular, EIF works indirectly, while we, for the vast majority of our activities, work directly. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Jeremy Wolf. I work for Investment and Pensions Europe. The readers have about 400, uh, 4 trillion under management for occupational pensions. So the question is, how much, uh, how much unused potential from that sector into the EIB is there, please? The volume mentioned by you goes a little bit beyond our imagination, but it would be very attractive to tap it a little bit. Uh, it, is not a, it is not quantifiable how much uh, that could be, but I believe that there is so much uh, money, I wouldn't say resting idle in the pension funds and other institutions like that, but a significant uh, part of it, I think, should be made available for financing projects which are in the public interest. And uh, the regulatory uh, framework is insufficient for that so far. And I'm, I'm in touch with many insurers and, and pension fund managers who say the same thing. But on the other hand, they have to stick to the rules as well. So as long as we don't have the, uh, the necessary regulatory re framework, uh, we are limited in attracting more funds from this source. I believe the political pressure will mount in this context considerably because we have come to the conclusion that now every, in every council meeting, whether it's the Finance Minister's Council, the Development Council, the Environment Council, uh, that the challenges we are going to have to face in the European Union in the next years are so enormous that the tapping of new resources is necessary. Look at the challenges which we identified in context in the preparation of the Juncker Plan with the in investment gaps. If you only compare the figures for the objectives set by the European Council and the member states. For several areas like climate change, energy efficiency, dealing with the integration of refugees, 
not only the immediate arrival help, but the in integration costs cost over the next years. If you put this together with the necessity to beef up our digital economy, to make sure that we have the necessary data centers to, de to process our own data, it is not only a question of, of uh, uh, broadband, it's also a question of data centers. If you add all this up and then look at the potholes in the roads and the fractures in the bridges in Europe, then you arrive in this comparison between what we want according to the decision of the European Council and what we have in the budgets of the member states and the European Union, you arrive at a volume of more than 500 billion euros per year. This is the investment gap in Europe every year. And if we want to catch up with our competitors around the world, after two decades of trailing behind their activities in research, development, and education by 1.5 to 1.8 percent, then we better speed up, and that requires the mobilization of these funds. And uh, I think we should have a closer look together, of course, with the legislators and the regulators at the funds you mentioned. Good morning, Christian Böhmer, German Press Agency. Mr. Heuer, I have two questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Juncker plan that in the last year, 16% uh, of the investment, overall investment value was reached. I would like to know your aim for this year and for 2017. And obviously, uh, the question is if the final, the final value of uh, 315 billion will be reached uh, in time. And second question, if I may, at the last European Council in December, there was a long discussion between leaders about the gas pipeline project Nord Stream, Nord, I guess it's Nord Stream, correctly, too, about the extension. I would like to know if, if your bank uh, is involved or might be involved. Thank you very much. On the second question, I have to say this is a highly political decision that is beyond the reach of, of the bank. If the project comes about, of course, we are a natural partner, th theoretically a natural partner in, in financing this, but it's uh, something that is presently hotly debated uh, among the political leaders, and we have to wait for the outcome of this, this debate. Uh, as uh, I said, in a different context, our energy policy is source neutral, and therefore also the, the transmission lines which might be a political issue, but not necessarily an economic issue, are something that we have to wait for. On the question of the figures, well, our people in the bank, and at the beginning of the process of the investment plan for Europe, it was, so to speak, the old staff, because we only began then to hire new staff in order to, to, to live up to the expectations of the Juncker plan over time. A difficult process, and I must say we have been more successful in hiring within one, recruiting within one year than ever in 2015. But still at the beginning, it was only the ones who were already there. And they went to this challenge with huge optimism and resolve and enthusiasm. And they managed to hammer out this huge volume of uh, projects already in the first six months. So now we have reached reality. We have touched ground and we go through the difficulties of the ground and that means we have to make sure that we, in contact with the project promoters, develop the necessary volumes of highest quality projects which meet the criteria of the Juncker plan. And uh, I would not uh, give any carte blanche that uh, this can easily be done. No, not at all. It's going to be a very, very big challenge. But on the other hand, after the experiences we had with these first six months and after the experiences we had with uh, the um, uh, engagement after the capital increase, I'm optimistic that this uh, multiplier can be reached on the basis of, of enough good projects. Ideally, it would balance out over time so that we do not have two big oscillations in the business development with the, with the Juncker plan, but I'm quite optimistic. But uh, we w would not say a, a precise target uh, for uh, six months or 12 months, we have a precise ticket target for uh, three years. And uh, I'm not relaxed. I'm never relaxed when these challenges are so big. But uh, I'm quite optimistic that we can do it. 
and every indication for the time being is there. Okay, that's a question now, then. Thank you. Florence Autre pour la GFI. Uh, about the, the, um, the fund, I mean the new fund, the EFSI, uh, you say, if I well understood, that 16% of the, the investment had been, had been agreed upon already. It means that the activities have begun, but still you hadn't any investment committee until now. So will the investment committee check again the projects that have been um, the, on which there has been decision in the past or not? And that's one question. Second question, you uh, talk about uh, new resources or resources that were, that were um, devoted to this plan, especially. I mean, could, be more, could you be more specific how, how many people are working specifically on the UNCO plan? How does it work precisely within the bank? Um. Warehousing project. Well, of course, the, uh, the idea behind this is the following. When the Juncker plan was established and we had the discussion in the European Council, the political leaders urged me to get the, with the of course, uh, with the necessary preparation, the regulation and legislation in place. So the European Parliament and the Council worked uh, very actively on that. So they did it by, by June. And then they urged me to say, don't lose time think about concrete projects already now, from the beginning. And in order to give the necessary democratic legitimacy to that, the regulation enabled the European Commission, so to speak, to step in for the investment committee as long as the investment committee is not there, is not in place yet. So for the time being, all the projects we have done have got the specific approval in a, in a separate approval process by the Commission. We always have the approval of the Commission through the Article 19 procedure because every project we finance must get the approval of the European Commission. But in addition to that check, they also check the availability of the EU budget guarantee in a separate check. And uh, so we need not go back to the Investment Committee with the project already ratified by the European uh, Commission. And on the, uh, on the resources of the bank, uh, for the Juncker plan, it is not very precisely to, to answer because uh, the, one of the decisions of the European Council in December 2015 was, by the way, in a change of the prepared conclusions of the European Council, that FC, which is still called a fund, should not be a fund, but an integrated a guarantee facility within the bank. So it's a li the, the wording is a little bit misleading. And at the end of the day, they didn't want to change it anymore. But uh, this fund is a guarantee facility which is fully integrated in the bank. And within the bank, we have made quite clear we will not establish separate structures for FC projects. Every project goes through the normal due diligence every project goes through in this bank. And therefore, we have collaborators, many, many of them, who uh, are operating across the spectrum of EIB activities, and therefore not only on FC activities. We have a couple of sections, of course, who are specializing on on the, this very mandate we have, but others are doing uh, regular projects just as well, normal projects, so to speak, that sometimes lead to interesting experiences. I mean, sometimes you have enthusiastic investors or project promoters who come through the revolving door of the bank with the expectation of leaving the bank with an FC loan. And when they are negotiating with our loan officers, they find out that they do not meet the criteria for the Juncker plan because it's the criterion of additionality, of additional risk, and all this has to, has been, has to be fulfilled. So they, they give up the idea of getting an FC loan, but at the same time, this person they meet in the bank will be able to explain them how interesting a regular EIB loan can be, and they leave the bank with a regular EIB loan and not an FC loan. And this is one of the reasons why it is important that we have, so to speak, a a one-stop shop for every uh, project promoter who might be interested in the cooperation with the EIB, our loan officers must be able to explain to the client whether uh, the uh, EIB loan, the regular one, is the right choice or uh, an FC-supported loan with a budget guarantee or whether we better send them to the EIF in order to do something about the equity side of their business. So we need to, to develop on that. That means, under the bottom line, 
that uh, we cannot say precisely, so, so to speak, by working hours per week, uh, how many people are working now on the Juncker plan and how many not, but I can tell you that we have recruited roughly 400 additional people last year and the main reason was for that was the Juncker plan. And we have not reached the, the limits. You know that the bank, the EU bank, is a very lean bank uh, in comparison to, to, the, to the balance sheet of close to 600 billion euros and the annual lending of 84.5 billion last year our staff of below 3,000 is limited, but we need to grow with the uh, expectations connected to the Juncker plan, also for the following reasons that nobody should forget. People have asked us to take higher risks, and that requires an even more tricky due diligence, and they have asked us to broaden the client base and to go for smaller tickets for smaller loan sizes. That means more human impact into the individual project, and therefore we need to grow. We will do it cautiously, because we need to maintain the necessary flexibility. Uh, we are not drunk by the size of the bank, but we have to deliver diligently and with the uh, necessary care, and therefore we have to expand the base of the, uh, of the work by uh, a couple of hundred people. Thank you. Yes, it's actually a follow-up to what my colleague just said. Um, so could you explain how many of the projects that are uh, approved have been checked by this commission who, who's taken the role of the investment committee? Uh, when the investment committee starts, how many projects will they have on their plate to check? Or, or are all of them already done by the, by the yes. commission uh, substitute? All of them have been done by the commission instead of the investment committee. And the investment committee, if I see it correctly, really will decide for the first time about projects at the end of this month in early February. And what does that say about the necessity of uh, the investment committee if the commission itself can do it? Well, I think uh, the <laughs> – no, let, let me approach it from a, from a very – fundamental European integration policy oriented point of view. Uh, we are doing something different with the Juncker plan because in addition to the fund that the investment bank invests into a project which we refinance in the international capital markets and for which the governing bodies of the bank take the necessary responsibility. Projects we take onto the balance sheet of the bank for which the board of directors of the bank is responsible. In addition to that, we tap the EU budget. And the, the sensational reform of the Juncker plan basically consists in the fact that we move from subsidies and grants to guarantees and loans. And for this use of the EU budget, you need democratic legitimacy. You need the legislator, the budget legislator, to agree with that. And in order to make sure that this can work, the legislator has insisted on an independent investment committee consisting of eight experts from around the European Union. It has been difficult to set that up. It is now in place, and they will take this decision and give the decision about the use of the budget a higher degree of legitimacy. Now, on the other hand, the European Council was in the situation of asking us to speed up and not lose a year because of that procedure. And since the European Commission definitely has a democratic legitimacy, it would be possible to take these decisions for the time being uh, within the structures of the European Commission. But this is a huge burden also for the Commission, so they have an interest as well to have the independent investment committee established. And this is the balance we had to strike, and I think it worked quite well. And we, I, to be honest, uh, uh, here I can say we thank the colleagues in the European Commission for acting quickly. and. Uh, and uh, diligently, it was a huge burden for them. Any more questions? Anywhere? Oh, yeah. Please. Bonjour, Mathieu Bion, uh, Agence Europe. Uh, une question dans la langue. I'd like to ask a question in the language of Victor Hugo, if possible. On the uh, refusal rate, what percentage of um, projects submitted to you do you not approve of in the framework of the Juncker plan? 
And how do you make sure that the projects you fund do not uh, find funding elsewhere from sources outside the Juncker plan? Very tricky question because uh, we have an interest of uh, fending off unreasonable projects from the beginning before it comes to a formal procedure. So I think the rejection rate is not really what what, what counts, what is relevant here. Uh, the, the formal rejection of a project in the board of directors is something that happens very seldom. But uh, of course, there are many uh, project promoters who arrive at the bank's doors and uh, have some illusions when it comes to, their, to the realistic um, perspective for their projects. And we convince them that it's better to to forget it, at least to forget the criteria for the Juncker plan, uh, which are pretty tough. Um, so this cannot really be this cannot really be quantified in a, in a meaningful manner. But on the second question, I think I should ask Ms. Santoni or Mr. Trömel to uh, go into this, Klaus. Um, I think that the question, thank you, President, the question about could they have could uh, promoters have found alternative financing. As the president said during his uh, presentation, we are, EIB is actually seeking to be the crowding in bank, and we would never achieve the, the, the 315 billion if we were not to get external funding in. However, these external funders are looking for sharing the risk, and the promoters are looking at sharing the risks uh, with the EIB, which in turn shares, uh, uh, um, excuse me, shares it with the EU budget. So therefore, um, the projects may have not had happened at all. And then once they have happened, thanks to the input of the combined input of the bank, the fund, and uh, supported by the EU budget through EFSI, we then are actually seeking to draw in private funds, as the, pres the president indicated. Because otherwise, this number of 315 would not be achievable only through ourselves. So the question is, would the project promoter have taken on the project at all, and can we support the project promoter taking it on? But then we would never finance 100%. We are also, by statute, not even allowed to finance 100% of a project. Thank you, President. More questions? We're, I, think we're, I think we're coming close to the end. So if there are no more questions, uh, thank you very much for coming this morning. You have documentation at the exit. And uh, have a great day and Happy New Year. <laughs>